During worship, the Lord gave me three visions, and I want to share those visions with you right now before I go into the Word. One of those visions was a, a line of toothpicks. And these toothpicks he had in his hand. And then he took his other hand and he broke every single one of those toothpicks. And he told me, tell them that their strongholds are like toothpicks to me. And I'm going to break every single one of them. He then shared with me a vision of someone running through a forest. And it's a very dark forest. And in front of you, there doesn't seem to be a clearing. And so God said, keep running through the forest, although you don't see anything. Although it's dark, just keep running through the forest. I'm with you, and eventually when you get to the end of it, there will be a clearing. There is an end to the forest, but keep going through it. He's with you. And this was the last thing he shared with me. He showed me someone going behind the veil into the Holy of Holies and shutting the veil. And he said, tell them this, that their peace is in the secret place. In this place, there is a, a hidden a hidden uh, part that you have with me in that place. And in this, the, the hidden place with me behind the veil is where you'll find your strength to keep going. I don't know who that was for, any single one of those pictures. But I do believe that God is breaking strongholds off of people's lives. And what you have to remember is that strongholds are like toothpicks to him. They are, a stronghold is nothing to God. All you have to do is when you feel the intensity of a demonic stronghold is to confess and repent. And it gives God the authority because you confessed and repented to come into that situation and to break that stronghold. And then, of course, we all know that we come to dark places in our life. And, you know, in a dark place, you can't see. But it doesn't matter that you can't see because he has eyes and he can see. And so you just keep running in the direction that he's telling you to go in, even if you can't see. And eventually, you're going to get to the clearing, and it's going to make a whole lot of sense. And then, of course, we know when you're hidden in the secret place with him in your heart, and you guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. It's there that you'll find the strength that you need to keep going. So if you're wondering, where do I get my strength? Hide behind the veil. Because it's there that you'll receive the strength strong enough to do what it is that God is calling you to do. So, happy 4th of July. Happy 4th. Happy Independence Day. I'm dressed a little bit casual tonight because it is 4th of July and there's going to be, you know, fireworks and all that kind of stuff. So we can dress casual in the house of the Lord. I want to just bring up this one quick announcement. We're in need of cafe workers, um, child care workers or uh, room captains, more or less. And we are also in need of media booths workers. If anybody has a desire to step into that new season and, you know, coming up this fall in any one of those areas, yes, start today. That's right. But a lot of people put their eyes on the fall for some reason. They're like, I'm not going to sign up for anything now until August comes. Sign up now and then let God figure out the time plan so you can be ready for the fall and fully stepping in full gear. Because each one of those Areas need a little bit of training, so you can start getting your training now so you're walking fully into it in the fall. All right, we're going to keep it short tonight because it is uh, the 4th of July and people do have places that they want to go. We've had a celebration here in the house of the Lord, simply worshiping God. It's beautiful to come into his house and worship him. And of course, we are celebrating that we are indeed free 
And, but freedom comes at a cost, right? Somebody had to pay the price for us to be free. Not only in the natural realm of, of our government but, and, and who we are as a country, but Jesus Christ had to pay the price so that we would be free in spirit, soul, and body. And so that's where we want to keep our focus tonight as we step into the Word. I want to teach tonight briefly on the concept of forgiving God. Now you might say, what? Forgiving God? Is that even theologically correct? How could it be that we even have the right to forgive God? You see, it's God himself that extends us forgiveness. Why would I bring up a topic like forgiving God? Because I'm going to share with you a story tonight about how sometimes we don't even realize that we're mad at God until somebody gives us the freedom to step into a place of actually saying, God, I'm not happy with you, and I need to position myself to have a relationship with you where I can forgive you because you already forgave me. Now, this is, a, this is a topic that is very intense because what it reveals is how much God truly loves us. You see, the Word tells us that He sent His one and only Son to die for us for forgiveness of sin. So He's the author of forgiveness because you were born into sin. We are all born into sin, right? There's not one of us that's not born into sin because sin is a part of human nature. So every single person on the planet was born into sin. And so God had to send his son, Jesus Christ, to shed his blood for us that we might receive forgiveness of sins. Well, why did he do that? He did that because he loves us and he wants to have relationship with us. So relationship with us is one of the most important things on God's plate. It was so important that he agreed with his son and the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ would come to earth to die for us so we could be reunited in relationship with God. So to God, forgiveness is huge. There's a lot of steps to forgiveness. I don't have time to go into all of those tonight, but I'm going to go really quickly. I'm going to take you on a real fast journey so that I can get to the forgiving God place. 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 through 12 reads, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives, us, lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So, when we talk about the concept of forgiving God, which is strange, it's strange to even say it, and I'm going to explain more about that, we have to first line things up under the fact that we understand forgiveness, period, because he was the example for us by sending his son Jesus Christ and Jesus accepting that, uh, that word, accepting that assignment and coming to the earth and dying for us and shedding his blood. And we're told that when we receive forgiveness of sins, what do we have to do? We have to confess that we need forgiveness. And then God will show us what it is that we need to be asking forgiveness for. And then we need to repent of that thing so we can be reunited in relationship with him. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It is a promise that he made to us. So before we get to the concept of forgiving God, we have to understand that forgiveness is a God concept. The first step is we learn to receive his forgiveness because we're sinners. We, 
we not only were born into sin, but we sin continually, okay? There are, we sin in, in thought. May, maybe it doesn't even make its way into an action. Uh, we, we sin in word. We sin in deed. We sin, and we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to confess what we've done wrong when he convicts us, and he, he convicts us. He does not condemn us. We are not condemned, and the truth of that is in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which makes an access point to God, which means we are not condemned. We are in a relationship with him where as a good father, he convicts us. When we receive that conviction, then we say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. Will you please forgive me? And forgiveness is already there. See, forgiveness is already there because of what Jesus already did. So when you ask for forgiveness, you're not asking it because now's some critical time that God's all of a sudden going to bless you with forgiveness. No, it's a concept from the beginning of time that he developed that we should be forgiven and he sent his son. So you are always forgiven. But what you have to do is you have to confess when he brings a conviction. And then you have to say, I'm not going to go in that direction anymore. I'm going to repent and do what I can to go over here. And then he gives us the power to go in the right direction and do the right thing. Now, the next step is once he forgives us, we have to forgive ourselves. Yes, you see, he can forgive you, but if you don't forgive you, then you're going to hold on to guilt and shame while he's already forgiven you. Then what good is it for him to forgive you if you're going to try and bear your own cross of guilt and shame and pain and all this ridiculousness that you carry with you when he already took care of it on the cross? Isn't it true that Romans chapter 6 says you died with Christ, you were buried in him, and you were resurrected in him? And that all happened when he went on the cross all these 2,000 and some years ago before you were even born. So it's not right for us to carry guilt, shame, fear, pride, all of these things because he took them on the cross and because they prevent us from getting close to him when he said, I already extended forgiveness to you. My son is evidence of that. So step number two is we have to learn to receive his forgiveness. It's where we re receive forgiveness and then we forgive ourselves. That's step two, we forgive ourselves. Step one is receive his forgiveness. Step two is forgive yourself. Then step three is Forgive another person. Yes, he tells us to forgive others. Whoa, that can be a hard concept. It's, it's hard to receive his forgiveness. It's hard to forgive ourselves, but it can be even harder to forgive another person. He tells us in, uh, in Matthew chapter 18, I'm not sure if it's going to be up here or not. He says, uh, Peter asks him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus said, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. 70 dash seven times. Okay? So in other words, forgiving others is supposed to be as frequent as it is that we're receiving God's forgiveness, that we're forgiving ourselves, but it's just to be as frequent to forgive another person. And so we need to make this a pattern in our life. So there's are three aspects of forgiveness. The fourth aspect is forgiving God. Now, let me talk to you about this. Because for the concept of forgiving God focuses in entirely on an understanding of his amazing, overwhelming, powerful, unending, divine love for you. Now, technically, we as the creatures of the Creator should never be in a situation where we should ever have to say, God, I need to forgive you, because God is sovereign and He can do whatever He wants to do. We are simply his creatures. However, he loves us immensely, and he wants nothing to come between us and him. And he knows his kids really well, and he knows that his kids might have received forgiveness. They might learn to forgive themselves, and they may even learn the concept of extending forgiveness. But what they never 
have the ability to deal with is the fact that when they hold on to anger toward God, they do not know how to release themselves from that. See, this fourth concept is something that human beings do all the time. They get angry with God. They blame God. They hold God at a distance. They say, God, you don't love me because this happened in my life. Come on, I'm talking to somebody out there. Don't look at me like I was the only one that needed to hear from God one day. Candace, do you forgive me? You see, our God is so gracious that he knows his children so well that he knows we'll carry with us even our blame toward him theologically not understanding who God is and his love for us will position us to hold God out here because we think he doesn't really love us because something happened in our life that was extremely painful. We had a tragic loss. We had an abuse. We had something that was beyond measure, yet something way down on the inside of us and a demonic voice tells us, well, God, let that happen to you. So we stand at a distance from him. Now let me tell you a personal story. At nine years old, I lost my father. He died. And he, he died at the age of 52. He had a, a massive heart attack. I went to school. I kissed him goodbye. I went to school. I came home and my house was filled with a bunch of people waiting to receive me to tell me that my father had passed. The only sound I made the day that I heard that when I was greeted by all my relatives in my house was a scream that was blood curdling. So this is what my mother tells me. I never cried another tear after that. All I did was scream. That was it. I asked for answers from people. What I got from the church was, your dad was a good man. God needed him. What I got from the church was a whole lot of incorrect theological answers to my father's death for a nine-year-old who is now abandoned. Because although my mother loved me dearly, what I didn't get from my father was the love and the admonition and the discipline that I needed when I grew up. So I became a rebel. I was rebellious beyond measure. And why? because I never dealt from that day forward with the fact that I was angry toward the loving God that I received as a child when I was really young, when I could not reconcile the fact that my father was gone and I loved him so much. God, how could you do this? What kind of God are you? You surely don't love me that you would leave me abandoned like this. So I grew up as a teenager. I looked good. I wore my cheerleading uniform and I made straight A's. I performed so well that nobody would ever know. But I was smoking pot behind the school. I was messing around. I was doing all kinds of stuff I should not do. And I was coming home with a smile on my face waiting for my mommy to say after she worked long, long hours and I was with a babysitter because she had to supply the needs of the family now because she was a single mother. So, Candace, how was school today? Oh, it was fine, Mom. I was lying. I was manipulative. I was controlling. I was a mess. So, this continued on into my college years. I was just about as crazy. But, but because I was culturally okay and society accepted me because I looked right and I acted right on the outside and I made really good grades and I kept going up the ladder and people wanted to hire me and all that was really great, I was able to hide under the mask. I met Pastor Adam and a lot of you know the side of the story where I received a supernatural healing from the Lord of Crohn's disease, anxiety, and depression, which by the way, Anxiety and depression came as a result of the fact that I was rebellious and I had never dealt with the loss of my father. So my body was always like this, all the time, worry, worry, anxiety. Because you know what? When you start playing games with manipulating everything in your life, you can't keep up with that. Or if you're lying right and left, you can't keep up with that. After a while, you're going crazy. So... 
God puts Pastor Adam and I together. I receive the supernatural healing. We both rededicate our lives to the Lord. You guys have heard a story. I'm not going to tell that one today. The story I'm going to tell now is a story after we're married and we have three small children. And we're living in Virginia. And I, I had turned my life around many years before and I committed to go to Bible study all the time because I believed that God could heal me. And then he could heal me from anxiety and he could heal me from depression and he could cause me not to be a liar or a cheat or a stealer or everything that I was. And I believed that he was better than all that. And if I stayed focused on the word, I'd be changed. And so I studied the word. I memorized it night and day. And God began to transform my soul. So in the middle of this Bible study, this women's study, uh, I went home, and we were going through the chapters, and we were on chapter 3. And, and as I was going through chapter 3, I started to ask some really deep-seated questions. And so I was answering them on a, on a piece of paper in my quiet time because I wanted to be clean. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, no, it was the audible voice. I am not crazy. It was God's audible voice. I'm working on something, and he says this. Do you forgive me? Do you forgive me? I start bawling. I just start bawling and bawling and bawling because I knew what the Holy Spirit had asked me. He, Holy Spirit was asking me, do you forgive me? Because God himself knew that I held him responsible for the death of my father. And, and because I had never said, God, I'm mad at you for what you did. I shut my mouth after that scream and I never responded and I lived my life as crazy as it was. But in that moment, Holy Spirit says, do you forgive me so that I'll open up and confess. I bawled and said, yes, yes, I do forgive you. But, but then I shook my head and I said, wait, you're the God of the universe. You, you should not be asking me if I forgive you. I'm a sinner. And then I realized I was flooded with the love of God and what he was speaking to me was, you don't understand how much I love you. And this has kept me and you apart for all these years, and I, God, can't stand it anymore. I want to be that close to you, and until you and I rectify this situation by you consciously walking through the process of forgiving me, even though I, God, no, I'm not responsible. Yes, I'm sovereign. Circumstances happened. There was an ordained time for your father's passing. It was terrible for you. I, God, realize that and know all that. So theologically, we were having this conversation that was very real about who he was and that he didn't have to do this. He didn't have to ask me. But what it showed me was how much he loved me that he would come down to my level and have a conversation with me about me and my issue. And that my issue was that I was holding him and everybody else at bay because I had not dealt with the fact that my father had died and I held God responsible. In that instant, my life was radically transformed. Why? Because I realized how much God loved me. Why would the God of the universe speak that to me? When from a theological perspective, I was nothing. And he was everything. And if this was part of some ordained plan, then I was supposed to live it out. But he wanted me to live it out right. And he knew the one, the one sword in my side or the one thorn in my flesh was the fact that I could not get close to a God that I thought would actually harm me. And he needed to let me know, no, honey, see, it wasn't me. I, I didn't harm you. You've been holding me responsible and running for all these years. Now let's have this moment together 
and make it right. And so I had my moment. I wrote down everything in my journal. I cried it out. I was astonished by the love of God. I was moved to intensity by the love of God and the fact that he would even speak to me that way when he didn't need to. When I was the one that needed forgiveness. Why? Because I had sinned by holding him responsible. See, even when we hold God responsible for something, we sin because it's not theologically correct to do that. Yet in my pride, I thought it was okay. I thought it was right to hold him at bay. Would he do anything else that would create problems and issues in my life? Would God do anything else that could possibly harm who I am? So I held him here. So that one question from God to me totally not only healed my life, but got me into right thinking about who I am in relation to my father. And that he loves me completely, but still, he is not one to be blamed. He is not one to be angry with. And when we blame him and we are angry with him, we are the only ones who suffer. And so this is the end of my message tonight if the band wants to come up. So forgiving God is a concept that is essential in understanding from the aspect that our loving father knows his kids sometimes need him to meet them where they're at, even if it doesn't 100% make sense. But once he spoke, everything made sense to me. And I had people even this week when I was talking about forgiving God they were like, how could you even say there's a concept for giving God? But then when they heard the story, they said, well, that's an interesting perspective because I myself have been angry with God. I myself have blamed him. I myself have held him responsible. But what I see now is that he really loves me and wants relationship with me, even though I feel that way about him. See, to blame God, to be angry with him, to do those kinds of things is not what we should be doing as the creation of the creator. But the fact of the matter is we're immature in our minds. We're immature in our thinking. And a good father meets the immaturity and the and the the purity of his kids and where they're coming from because he wants to teach them and train them. So God taught me and trained me in that moment about who he was. And what, what did I find? That he is an amazing God of love, that he would even speak to me. So as I do the altar call tonight, if you've been angry with God, if you blame God for the things that have happened in your life, if you hold him responsible because you even understand his sovereignty to any, any degree at all, I want to invite you to receive a healing tonight so that when you go and celebrate your freedom, your independence, you can celebrate the fact that God made a way for you to be free. And it was through his son, Jesus Christ. The altar team is going to come up at this particular point. Obviously, if you never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to invite you to do that. That's, that's simple. You simply confess that you need him. You confess that you're a sinner and you need him. And you confess that he came. You confess that as an act of, of confession of faith. I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to save me from my sin. And then the word says you shall be saved. So if that's you tonight, we want you to receive salvation for the first time. But you may need to receive a healing. And maybe everybody in the house is okay tonight. But if you see people manifesting behavior where they're acting like they're very angry about things that have happened in their life, as people helpers, you can always say, are you mad at God? And if they say yes, you can say, you know what? God knows you are, and he loves you so much.
He's not responsible, but maybe you need to forgive him. Because once you recognize that and you do, even though he's not responsible, it's going to break something off of you. So you'll then have the freedom to keep going, to keep running, to keep stretching yourself, to keep moving forward to your purpose and destiny. So Father, we say we thank you so much in this place tonight, God. And we pray for all of those, Lord, that have been holding you at bay, that have been suffering, that have been crying, that have been upset about loss and trials and other things in their life. And somewhere way down deep, way into the subconscious part of them, they blame you, Father. Forgive us of our sin. You are not responsible, God. And so as a priestess of the Lord, I stand before you tonight and I say thank you that you love us so much and you extend a hand down to us and Jesus is evidence of that. But Father, I confess and say, we know you are not responsible. We know, Father, that you are awesome, you are mighty and you are loving and you made a way for us to have relationship with you. Please forgive us if we hold on to that. And we thank you and we all say together, amen.